remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer troubles and evil doer even to bonds or chains, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And so shall his word be, which goes forth from his mouth, it shall not return in the void, but will accomplish all that the Lord pleases for it to do. Amen. Well, God's word this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, particularly verse 8 this morning, we're going to spend some time on before we lead into communion together. Uh, we'll be looking at Paul's gospel. He calls it my gospel. He has personal ownership of this message. And he, in one line, will unpack the gospel in short. Jesus Christ became man in the line of David, died for our sins and rose from the dead. What a glorious gospel we have, saints, that we can have the comfort of not a false religion, whether it was a dead cult leader or a dead self-professed saviour that we can visit their grave. You cannot visit <laughs> we, the supposed grave of where Christ is, but he is risen, saints, and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And so as Paul reminds Timothy of this wonderful gospel that he represents, he started in chapter 2. If we can quickly go back and have a look. In verse 1, he's commanding Timothy as a faithful gospel minister to be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts there, you therefore, Timothy, you, it's a direct command to him, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In verse 3, he goes on and says, now you again, therefore, remember to endure hardness. And he draws on Timothy as a, uh, a minister of the Lord to know that this isn't always going to be easy. Some have departed and defected, and it is time for him to remember what it is to stand firm in the faith, like a soldier, like an athlete, like a tiresome, uh, like a, a tireless labouring farmer. Uh, he is to be that godly, faithful elder who is to raise up other elders uh, in Ephesus, the church there, so that he can go and be with Paul one final time before Paul goes to be with the Lord. Timothy must know and learn that he's going to endure through some level of suffering. Now, saints, this is a reminder to us that we serve the Lord and sometimes you might have your easy weeks, you might have your tough weeks, and you need to be able to endure. Those that endure to the end, the Bible says, shall be saved. It's a proof that we're born again, that God has done a work in our hearts. Many people may try and follow the Lord from religious duty or some sort of um, spiritual fervor that they drum up within themselves. But ultimately, in the end, we know that only those who are drawn from the Lord and kept by God's power will truly endure to the end. And that's where our hope is not in ourselves, is it? It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. We're not our own Savior. Christ is our Savior and our Lord. And again, by way of reiteration, we looked last week at 1 Timothy, and maybe we just turn back there again, just to, again, reiterate this, these truths that we're building on, that the Christian faith is one that isn't just come to Jesus and all your problems are sorted. If anything, Paul models a, a, a gospel that comes with troubles, a gospel that comes with afflictions, and of course, Jesus prepared his own disciples by saying, if they hate me, they're not going to like you either particularly if you're going to represent the faith well. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we see that we are to greatly rejoice, although for a season, if need be, if, if it happens, if it becomes our lot, that we are in heaviness through manifold temptations, many different kinds of temptations. This isn't just a, the temptation to sin. This is the temptation to think more highly of ourselves than us than we ought to. It is the temptation to maybe choose our own way above the Lord's. It is the temptation to think that maybe God is with us in our suffering. So there's many different temptations that we can face here. 
And Peter goes on and says, that what? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, though it be tried with fire, might be found with the praise and the honour and the glory of Christ at his appearing. What's our goal? Not to live our best life now. Our goal is to live and suffer for Christ if need be, so that our faith may be proven true and born of God, and that when Christ comes back for us, we may hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. It'll be worth it in the end, saints, when you hear those words from the Lord Jesus, despite what you suffer. It'll be worth saying no to worldly temptation. It'll be worth saying no to the world. It'll be worth saying no to more of these other things in this life which the Gentiles seek after, so that we may win salvation in Christ Jesus. Those beautiful words from our Saviour come uh, and uh, inherit all that the Father has given. Timothy, therefore, is meant to be a godly example to the church in Ephesus. He is to watch his life and doctrine closely, and he is being watched. Maybe we can turn now back to 1 Timothy. And, uh, yes, we're in 2 Timothy. But let's go back to 1 Timothy, where Paul's reminded Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, that he is to be an example to the flock. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. Job is to be an 
and do a hard necessary good soldier, to run the race like a, a fit and focused athlete, and finally to labour uh, throughout thick and thin, no matter what weather conditions, like a faithful farmer, so that we can reap uh, the righteous reward that the Lord had for us, has for us, should I say. Now we've looked, and I'm just going to sort of zoom out here as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 now. So I'm just layering our introduction. And we've looked particularly at how Paul addresses gospel ministers, and we can all be classed in this in some respect because a minister is a servant. We're all called to serve the Lord's purposes. And so we see here in chapter 2, and if you're taking notes, I can show you quickly in, in short format what Paul has looked at and encouraged to begin with. The first one is in verses 1 and 2. So firstly, he's looked at his godly character. God will not use you and you will not last in ministry if your character isn't representative of Christ. Amen, everyone? Uh, you know, your character has to be proven before you're even given any form of leadership or place in the body of Christ to uh, teach or to minister to others. And Timothy's character has been tested. He is to have strong, gracious, Christ-like leadership. We can see there, be strong the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men. So Timothy has to be both gracious and faithful. And that's the godly character that is being looked for there in him. And he's then to, in that faithfulness, prove it by taking the same message that Christ preached and that Paul preached and that he preached and passed on to other faithful men. So we have the commission in all New Testament churches for the elder or the pastor to raise up other godly and faithful men that have the grace of Christ being worked in them and to see them uh, step up to uh, loving the Lord's church and to serving them and faithfully modeling the graces and, and ultimately those who are called secondly and gifted to teach uh, so the second area there is verse 2, where these men are not only called, but they are gifted to teach. All elders have the ability to teach, according to 1 Timothy and Titus. And so Timothy is, in essence, being called here to raise up other leaders. Uh, this gift is something that if we look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, so just go back a chapter, we can see that this gifting of teaching and spiritual gifting that he's given as a leader, not just to teach, but we believe in some other things there as well, to administrate in the church uh, and to discern false teachers and some other gifts around knowledge and wisdom. Uh, we do believe that in 2 Timothy 4 there, verses 14, uh, 1 Timothy, sorry, let me say in 2 Timothy, <laughs> get myself caught up here, 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7. I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. So the gift of God is clarified there in the end, Timothy. And then go back to 1 Timothy now, just a couple of pages, and look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Timothy is told not to neglect the gift that is in him, which was given to you by prophecy, by the laying on of hands in the presbytery. In essence, when he was commissioned to ministry, they put a hand on his shoulder and prayed over him and said, you are called to this ministry, and because you are called, you are gifted to this ministry. Let's be clear that God does not, uh, everyone who God calls him gifts. The calling and the gifting of God is without repentance, but we're Romans, that both go together. God doesn't call anyone, but he doesn't also gift. It's very clear that if the gifting is there, the calling has to be there. Uh, before the gifting is released, character must be clarified. So we've got godly character, number one, verses one and two. We've got spiritual gifting in verses two. And then we've got a Christ-like attitude in verses three through seven. We see it's the attitude of a faithful gospel minister to discipline their mind and their heart and their activities uh, to serving the Lord faithfully. Timothy's told to have the, the attitude of a soldier, the attitude of a uh, athlete, and the attitude of a farmer. Now, the attitude, I, 
will often think of uh, the attitude being the determiner of how we get on with things, like a soldier. How do we treat it? Well, we treat it like a soldier. How do you get on with the job like a soldier, like a farmer, like an athlete? So the attitude is the how we get on with it. How are we to think of ministry and getting on with it? What we're about to get into today is verses 8 through 10. We'll probably just touch on verse 8 today. And this is not the attitude which we did in verses 3 through 7. This is the motivation. Now, how many of you know that motives are very important? Because the motives are not how you get on with it, they're why you're doing what you're doing. So your motives are very important. Do you know you can look like you're doing the right thing, but have an ulterior motive? Which can be very scary in Christianity because people can look like they're doing godly things, but they're doing it for the wrong reason. To please people, maybe to win brownie points with someone. Maybe to look like they're ticking the religious box. But what we've got to be careful of here is in all service, our motives must be right. Amen? Yes. We've got to have a pure motive, a godly motive. And the motive, uh, of course, in Scripture is that we would do all things, First Corinthians chapter 3, to the glory of God. That's our motive, to bring glory to Him who has called us, saved us, kept us, and will bring us only him in the final um, uh, in the end of all things. So here is where we really get now into the, the motive and we'll be able to then in the next couple of weeks talk about our motives and what should motivate us to serve the Lord. This is very, very important for us as a church because we can be driven by lots of other things. Why would you come to church? Why would you share your testimony? Why would you go to all the trouble of being persecuted for your faith? Why? It's a very important question, isn't it? The why question becomes critical. What should motivate Timothy according to Paul? Well, Paul's going to give Timothy three reasons of what should motivate him to keep going. Motivation asks, answers, should I say, the why questions of what we need to think about when things get tough. Why stick with it when others have deserted, departed, betrayed? Why not follow the crowd? Why not do my own thing? Why put myself through so much unnecessary pain for the church when they don't seem to be appreciating all of my efforts? Why discipline myself like a soldier or like an athlete? That's hard work, like a farmer. Why be committed to this when I've suffered so much for it? And Paul's going to answer that question today as we look at verse 8 and then next week at verses most likely 9 and 10. Let's look at what they are in short and get to it because we've got a little bit of work to do here. So, point number one, if you're taking notes or our outline, we are to remain motivated in ministry. Why? Because, number one, because of the gospel of the resurrected Christ. What's driving us? Why do we keep at this? Because the gospel is the power to save. The preached message of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, the fact that Christ is resurrected from the dead, that he came in the line of David, that he lived a life, died in our place, as we heard this morning, and rose from the dead. That's Paul's gospel. That's my gospel, Paul says. And that's our gospel. That's what we live and die for. That's why we get up in the morning. That message is why we persevere in the faith, Paul said. Yeah, I know, we're a reformed church. We're big on the gospel. But anybody that's a church should be big on the gospel. Yeah. Reformed or not. I think it's pretty clear in Scripture that Paul's a gospel man and Timothy's a gospel man and we need to be as well. And this is why it's so important to land the plane, so to speak, on what the gospel is. If we don't recognise up front our need of the gospel, we will simply miss the whole reason why we need to serve the Lord faithfully and why we stick with it day in day. When you have an appreciation of the gospel, you're a Christian every day of your life because outside of the gospel, you're toast. You're in sin, you're lost, you're heading to an eternity outside of Christ. You're in big trouble. What we read this morning is you're dead in sins and there's no hope. And we've got a great message, obviously, in the Lord Jesus coming and really giving us the answer. So that's what we looked at this morning. What a beautiful picture around the Lord's table. To find ourselves here in verse 8 this morning, the Lord providentially orchestrates each passage for 
his glory and uh, particularly around the elements here today. Secondly, what should motivate us as Christians? Have a look at it. Verse 9. The Word of God should motivate us. The Word of God, watch this, that cannot be chained. Paul is chained. He's in prison. He's locked up, but God's Word cannot be stopped. They can try and stop Paul by putting him in prison, locking him up, chaining him down next to a Roman soldier, but you cannot stop God's Word. It is invincible. It will not be held back. People have tried to burn Bibles and take out churches and eradicate every form of translation of Scripture, and it keeps on going. It is invincible. It is unstoppable. God's Word, when you preach it, speak it, read it, will do its work. It will, as we've read this morning, will accomplish all that God has intended it for it to do. Hebrews 4.12, it is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Hebrew writer talks about natural things, the sword. And he says, well, God's Word is going to outdo any physical sword. It has life and power from God Himself. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will endure forever. He's going to back it up. Oh, just preach on that one, but that's going to be next week. And then thirdly and finally, what should motivate us? Can you see it there in verse 10? The salvation of the elect, which is still to be obtained. What should motivate you? There are still people to be saved. There are still people to hear the gospel through the preaching of the word of God who have come still to obtain salvation. And Paul calls them the elect, those whom God has chosen. Well, what a motivation to stay faithful in ministry. There are still people who haven't heard the gospel, people who need to hear it and hear it preached well and clearly and succinctly so that they may recognize their need of a saviour and that they may recognize that I was lost but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And they come into the faith. They're called out of the world and they obtain salvation. It's like an ownership word there. You get it. It's given to you by grace. You are saved. Wow, what? Three powerful motivators for ministry right there in front of us. The blessed message of the gospel the most powerful message that the world's ever heard, the living and active Word of God, which we can lean and abide on and remain in, knowing that every word is true, God will back it up. And finally, that these means of grace and our use of them faithfully mean that the elect will be called in and obtain the salvation that's required. We've got a job to do, haven't we? We've got a gospel to preach. We've got the Word of God to live by and obey, and we've got to see Christ's church built, and we work with the Lord on that. We're partners in the gospel together. Paul calls some of the New Testament churches, we're to do this together. So the main point being this, Timothy must be motivated to persevere in gospel ministry. Timothy is motivated to persevere in ministry by remembering God's Son, God's Word, and God's people. Said it one more time. Timothy's motivated to persevere in ministry because he's remembering God's Son, God's Word, and God's people. There's this theme of remembering here as we look at verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, while you're in 2 Timothy there, in verse 8, he said, remember, but if you go forward to verse 14 of chapter 2, of these things, put them in remembrance. So, Timothy, you need to remember, and in remembrance, you need to put them in remembrance. If we go back and have a look at chapter 1, verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, and verse 6 of chapter 1, when I put you in remembrance of the gift that you have, stir it up. With the putting on my hands, there's a lot of reminding that Paul's giving Timothy to not forget these things. And as we lean into the motivation here of why Paul uh, is telling Timothy why he should be doing something, 
what his motivations are. I think it's important for us to remember our own motivations that we shouldn't forget that we need to be motivated appropriately for serving the Lord uh, and ensuring that we are doing it for the right reason. Remember and not forget. It implies forgetfulness, doesn't it? Forgetting the right motive for serving the Lord. Forgetting up out of bed in the morning. Uh, it's an, an imperative here, remember. It's a command. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. It's a command here. Timothy, don't forget the gospel of the resurrected Christ. Every day you get up, every day you think, okay, what am I doing today? Remember the gospel first. Remember the resurrected Jesus Christ first. Isn't it interesting that this should be a motivation for Timothy? Uh, not the actual... Um, Resurrection. Uh, if you look at it here really carefully, he's to remember Jesus Christ, who was resurrected. I think some people have taken this a little bit out of kilter. This isn't Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, remember the resurrection. Or remember that Jesus was uh, of the seed uh, of the line of David. He's saying that, but the point is up front. Remember Jesus Christ. Him who became man through the line of David and was resurrected from the dead to prove that he indeed was God as well. So we've got the God-man thing going on here. This is the gospel because God becomes man. God so loved the world that he sent. Where did he send his son from? From glory, from heaven. Christ is the eternal son who came to take on our flesh to save us. Now, the way... Uh, Paul references our Lord here is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the first word, humanity. When he is prophesied to become man, he says, you'll call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Jesus represents the name of Christ's humanity. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, represents the one who would come from heaven, the divine one, and bring an answer for our solution to the problem of our sin when Adam fell in the garden. So one is Christ the man, Jesus. One is Christ who, who God would come and represent man and fulfill all of Old Testament prophecy and take our place and bring us salvation. The, the man who was God, Jesus Christ. The man, Jesus, who grew up in a normal family, who was born of a virgin, and Christ, the one who was God in flesh, who said, I am, before Abraham was, I am. And he proved it all, according to Paul, by raising himself from the dead. Wow. What a message. What a gospel. I mean, of all the messages to believe from a religious prophet or leader is the one where Jesus comes down and deals with our dilemma. Friends, in every other religion, you've got to make it up to there, don't you? It's what you do, it's your works, it's your giving, it's your handing out tracts, it's your knocking on doors, it's your uh, doing good works. It's all about how you get up here. But in the gospel, we have Christ come down to us through the line of David, and Christ becomes man. Let's turn back to the Old Testament to see one of these most poignant prophecies that speak to this as Nathan prophesies over David, of whom God knows that the Savior will be born out of his line. In 2 Samuel, let's turn there together. The second Samuel chapter 7. And verse 4. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Shall you build me a house for me to dwell in? It's a question. You know, build me a house so I can dwell in it? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children 
of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but a walk in a tent and in a tabernacle. God is always with his people. And the tent or the tabernacle or the house represents God with his people. Now, we did that in the wilderness by the, the cloud and the pillar of fire. God always has a representation of himself among his people. Today, Christ is represented among us in the elements. And we partake spiritually, if you like, of his flesh and blood, right? We're, we're partakers of him. We're one with him in that beautiful doctrine of union. There's always a representation of something of God who represents his people. God was in the garden with Adam and Eve, wasn't he? He always kept something for himself in the tree that they were not to touch. And so, in all places that I have walked with the children of Israel, verse 7, so I spoke with a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people in Israel, saying, Why build you not the eight house of cedar? Now therefore, so you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, the whole second prophecy. So he's going to get multiple prophecies here from Nathan, building one on the next. Okay, God's always with his people. He was with them in the Old Testament. He was with them as they came out of Egypt. He was with them in the tent uh, and in the wilderness and in the tabernacle. So now my servant David, I took you from among the sheepfold, verse 8, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. Verse 9, and I was with you wherever you went, and I cut off all your enemies out of your sight, and made you a great name, like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Now moreover, Here's the reason, basically, Nathan saying why I did this, the Lord's prophesying. I will appoint a place for my people, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own. And move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before. Verse 11, and since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and cause you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. He will make you a house. How is he going to do that? When your days are fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers, so David knows his part, but now the prophecy goes on to, you're going to die, and then what's going to happen after you? Watch this. I will set up a seed after you. It's very important here because Paul uses in 2 Timothy the seed of David. comes from the Greek word spermatops, it means literally impregnated, right? The ability to give life through the birthing process. God controls it all. No one knows how that all happens in a womb, but life happens, of course. God breathes life into that womb, and I will set up your seed after you, which shall proceed out of your bowels. God knows, you don't think God's in control of everything, He knows already. How Christ is going to come, how many generations it will be, who will be in the right through the family line. We look back and discover our family line. God knows it from beginning to end. And I will establish his kingdom. Now watch this. He's not talking David anymore. He's talking one who is greater than David. And he shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Of course, this is clear reference to Christ now. Nathan doesn't know it, but basically he's prophesying of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will be, watch this, his father, and he shall be my son. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And if he commit iniquity, well, hang on a second, Jesus didn't commit any iniquity. What, what's going on there? I will chase him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. This is still about the poor Jesus. Yeah, Jesus carried the iniquity and the chastening of the rods of men and the stripes of the children of men because we already read this morning. By his stripes we were what? Healed. This is not only pitching to the Lord Jesus and prophesying him, it's saying he's going to carry the sins of men, the stripes of men. He will bring healing. And verse 15, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put it away before you in your house. 
and the kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And notice that forever, God sets up an eternal covenant with this promise. David, out of your line, out of your lineage, out of your family line will come a saviour, a king, a ruler. He will be a son. I will be his father. He will carry the sins of his people. And he will rule and reign and establish a kingdom forever. Pointing to the Lord Jesus. This is two millennia before it actually happened. You don't think God's in control of things? Paul describes here in verse, in this is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, the life of Christ. He would be born of the line of David. The death of our Lord as well, his resurrection will be raised from the dead. Christ was truly the only man born to purposely die. It's an oxymoron in itself that God himself predestined this to take place. Why? Because we, in the first Adam, had fallen. Adam is told that when he eats of the fruit of the tree, both he and he eat of it, they will surely die. They didn't die the day they ate, but they did physically, but they did die spiritually. God himself remedies the situation by us not working our way towards him. Yes, we would work. We would work by the sweat of our brow and we would feel the pain of what it is to live in a sin-ravaged world. We would feel the weight of what it is. We feel it today, don't we? As we live our lives, trying to live godly in Christ Jesus in a world that we're rolling up the wrong end of the stream. We have to fight to live godly every day. We know what it is to live by the sweat of our brow and to work in our sanctification with fear and trembling. Yet God in his mercy sent his son through the line of David to live the life we couldn't live and deal with our sin, wipe it away and forgive it. We cannot atone for our own sins, so that's why we need Christ here. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, but God, who is rich in mercy. But God didn't have to send us a saviour. He could have left us. But 2,000 years before Christ came, he said, no, I'm going to send my son, and my son will establish a house and say you're a part of the house of God, the elect who have obtained salvation in Christ and him alone, a house that will never be defeated and that will endure forever and ever. Even when we were dead in sin, Ephesians 2 verse 5, he has made us alive together with Christ by grace, you are saved. Romans 5 a, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to me, the gospel is this, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, that Christ was born of the line of David, of the seed of David, and he died and came resurrected, was resurrected from the dead. You've got to be a man to die. If you come as God alone, as a phantom, somebody that just looked like they were in the flesh but weren't, you can't die. A spirit lives forever. An angel or a demon lives forever. You've got to be a man to die. Now, there are eyewitnesses on the cross. Christ breathed his last. He was buried. And grave sealed up for three days. Uh, he died for us. Romans 5, 6, just at the right time when we were powerless. Yeah, dead in our sins, powers. What can a dead man do? Christ died for the ungodly. Yes, he died for us when we were enemies of the cross of Christ. This is the beauty of the good news of the gospel. God the Father did not spare his only son but gave him up for us all. And proved that throughout all of human history, God has always had his chosen people. He knows them before they're even born. Jeremiah is a prophet in his mother's womb called to the nations before he's even born. Of course, we know Romans 9, the twins that are in their mother's womb, before having done either good or evil, God knows their eternal destinies. Yet they are free of their own human volition to do and choose those things as they ought. Yet God, who knows their end from their beginning,
that determine each one of their lives. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's the most loving thing God the Father could have done is sent his own son in flesh to be born of the line of David. That everyone who believes on him should not perish. Saints, listen to me, if you don't hold to the gospel today, God's plan is that you should not perish, but you will if you do not accept Christ the Son. God knows what should, what your response should be to the gospel. The Father knows what your response should be, knowing that you are now dead in sins and need Christ's absolving power in your life. That you should respond and accept Christ for the forgiveness of sins because you cannot save yourself. And if you perish, you will perish of your own volition. Now the other reason for mentioning the resurrection here in verse 8 is of course the importance of what the re resurrection means to the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, Paul says, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and in vain. We believe a lie. Your faith, your preaching, it's all come to a pack of nothing. Which is why we must hold to a resurrection in all of these things. The resurrection is both a sign and a seal of the truth of the reality of the gospel, the veracity of the truth. Christ in his preaching, he fulfilled it. Destroy this temple and what? In three days, I will raise it up again. Jesus raised himself from the dead because he's God. That's what God does. You can't kill him who is both man and God. Had commanded the angel to roll away the sun. He's not here. He is risen. He is alive. So yeah, this is the sign and the seal that God is indeed who he is. God in flesh. John 1, 4, in him was life. And that life was the light of man. In Christ, in the Logos, the eternal Logos was life, and that life was the light of man. John 5, 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so also he granted the Son to have life in himself. In actual fact, the Spirit has life in himself as well, because the Spirit is the one who enters our hearts and regenerates our hearts, renews our hearts, and gives us spiritual life. And sustains that life within us. Which is why we can say have, we say we have Christ the hope of glory in our hearts through the shedding of the Spirit Romans uh, abroad within our own heart. And this is why Jesus could truly say in the days of his flesh as a man, and yet God, John eleven twenty five, as he says to the woman, I am the resurrection and the life. I am, he uses the tetragrammaton there. The I am of the Old Testament. Moses tells them, I am that I am sent you. And Jesus uses the same phrase with this woman. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live. Even though he dies naturally, he will live spiritually and he will live eternally. So we're all going to die. The promise for eternal life is not about living longer in this life. You may live another five days, five years, 50 years. Well, you will live exactly the amount of days that the Lord has fulfilled for you as Nathan prophesied over David. When your days are fulfilled, 2 Samuel 7, we've all got days to fulfill. Now, quite frankly, some of us think we've got longer than we've actually got. We need to get on with it. And we need to live fully for the glory of God. And we need to recognise that we live for the propagation of gospel and the resurrection message is the, the, the powerful sign and seal that the message that you live for and might be willing to die for, Christ not only did that but he brought veracity and truthfulness to that because he rose from the dead and we have hope in that same gospel. Listen to Charles Wesley's great classic hymn. Vain the stone, the watch, the seal Christ has burst the gates of hell. Death in vain forbids his rise. Christ has opened paradise. Lives again our glorious King, where, O oh, death, is now thy sting. Once he died our souls to save, where's thy victory, boasting grave?
soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head. Made like him, like him we rise, ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Well, Wesley certainly got it right there, didn't he? Uh, the great resurrection, the seal, the hope of the gospel that we represent. The thing that motivates us in ministry is the gospel. Now, as we go on next week, we're going to about to turn to the Lord's table now. But as we go on next week, we'll also see in verses 9 and 10, our great motivation for ministry is not just the gospel, but it is the word of God, and that the word of God cannot be stopped. So we must continue to preach the word of God, live the word of God, obey the word of God. It's our primary tool. When you go into battle, the armor of God, Ephesians 6, you only have one offensive weapon. It's the sword of the spirit. So we have the word of God that takes us forward. Yes, we have defensive armor and the fact that we've got a shield, but our only offensive weapon is the word of God. We go in to battle, we represent the Lord, we represent gospel ministry with the word of God, which cannot be bound. Yes, Paul's in a prison, but you cannot lock up and chain and stop the word of God. And of course, uh, the final uh, thing there, which is those who are still to obtain salvation. Well, let's, um, let's come now before uh, the table of the Lord and uh, prepare our hearts.